This is Dr. Clark, and this is Chapter 12, going to be over nutrients and metabolism. Kind of gone over a lot of this already in AMP1 and chemistry, uh, but we're going to go back over it, uh, and we're going to start off here with nutrients. And so nutrients are substances derived uh, from ingestion of food, um, air, water, there's somehow or another they are brought into the body. And um, there's actually right here in this big circle, there's actually um, seven main nutrients. Um, and the first actually being oxygen, which you inhale. Uh, but we're going to really go over more of the ones that are ingested. And uh, that's going to be water, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, vitamins, and minerals. And they kind of show right here in the circle what is most needed. Uh, oxygen is the most heavily required nutrient. Without it, life um, will uh, not go on for a very long period of time. Um, so this is a matter of minutes without oxygen uh, that an animal will die. Um, water is the next most needed. Um, this is a matter of days. Dehydration can kill them. And then starvation can actually take uh, weeks or months. And that's going to be things like carbohydrates, um, Next up would be your proteins and fats, and then you can see here in the very centers, um, vitamins and minerals, and these take a lot longer um, to harm. So, and you can see how little that the vitamins and minerals are needed as compared to proteins and fats, as compared to carbohydrates, as compared to water, as compared to the body's need for oxygen. When we look at nutrients, we have energy producing nutrients. So these are nutrients that will actually um, produce energy to keep the body um, going. These main ones are going to be carbohydrates and fats. Proteins are used more as building blocks, but they can be converted over into energy if needed. Um, Non-energy producing, so these are things that do not produce any energy in the body uh, whatsoever. These are going to be things like water, vitamins, and minerals. And then we also get into essential and non-essential nutrients. So uh, Essential, uh, non-essential nutrients are things that the body can make itself. Um, non-essential nutrients, uh, there's a lot of those uh, that the, the body can ingest and convert, um, whereas essential nutrients are ones that the animal actually has to sit there and ingest because it's not able to manufacture it. Um, there's going to be some amino acids that we'll talk about that will be essential um, that most animals cannot uh, make in their liver themselves uh, and so those actually have to be ingested. Uh, also things like certain vitamins like vitamin C to humans and guinea pigs. Uh, this actually has to be ingested uh, and our body is not able to actually make this on our own. So oxygen is the most vitally required nutrient. Without it, like I said, life uh, will end within minutes. Uh, water is the, the next most uh, needed nutrient. Uh, and it's obtained by drinking water or ingesting liquids. Uh, and it's also by ingesting food. And, of course, water is a universal solvent. It's needed for um, moving things around in the body. It also helps in uh, dissolving proteins, fats, carbohydrates, uh, and allowing them to be moved and, and allowing certain things to go on uh, through the body with those um, lipids, of course, don't really dissolve, but it's a transport medium for them. Um, but carbohydrates and proteins definitely do. Uh, mammals, on average, consist of about 70% water. And so uh, what this really is, is neonates are as uh, much as 80% water, uh, whereas geriatric patients are about 50%. The average adult animal is about 60% water. The amount of water that's needed daily by an animal is um, pretty much close to what its daily energy requirements are going to be. So the water in this actually goes hand in hand. Um, certain mammals have actually learned uh, how to survive uh, in extreme harsh environments by um, conserving water. Uh, and so we actually can look at um, like the kangaroo rat that lives in the desert that actually gets all of its water um, by... Uh, the food that it ingests and actually does not drink it because where it lives out in the desert during its lifetime it might ne never rain. Uh, and so there are some ways that animals have learned to get this amount of water uh, 
uh, without necessarily having to drink it. But all animals have to ingest water. Um, so it doesn't matter if it's a whale, if it's a snake. Um, there, even, even this kangaroo rat that doesn't actually drink water, it's still ingesting it, and it's ingesting it through food. So uh, all animals have to ingest water to be able to live. Almost all the metabolic processes require uh, in the body require water. Um, they're going to require it uh, to either transport substances around like enzymes to allow metabolism to take place. They're going to dissolve certain things. Uh, so remember, without water, you don't get acids, uh, bases, electrolytes. Um, and then it's going to actually bring products needed for metabolism to the cells, and it's going to remove those wastes away. Water also serves as a lubricant for body tissues. Um, the circulatory and transport medium that it is, it's very important uh, for chemical reactions of digestion to take place. Water can also be used as a way to maintain body temperature. So through like people in horses sweat. So the water actually comes out to the surface of the skin and is evaporated to actually cool uh, the body temperature down. Whereas animals like dogs, cats, and cattle, while you ruminants, they actually pant. And by panting, you actually move moisture across the mouth and uh, mucous membranes in the nose and this actually kind of works the same way as sweating it helps to evaporate uh, excessive heat out of the body through moisture moving on to carbohydrates um, these are going to be kind of broken up into uh, things like sugars starches and cellulose uh, sugars are your simple monosaccharides and disaccharides so when you hear something a sugar it's still a carbohydrate but it's going to be Monosaccharides and disaccharides, so very simple carbohydrates, very easily to break down. They come from things like fruit, sugar cane, honey, milk, sugar beets. Uh, so like table sugar is a uh, uh, actually a disaccharide. It's a combination of glucose and fructose. Um, or actually I think it's sucrose and fructose. But uh, either way it goes, it's two simple sugars put together is, uh, is your regular table sugar that you're going to use. Uh, and so these are fairly quickly broken down by the body and they're used up fairly quickly and they're very quickly converted to easily to glucose. Um, starches are more complex or polysaccharides uh, and they're going to usually come from grain sources such as wheat, corn, uh, oats, root vegetables like potatoes uh, and carrots uh, and legumes. So things like uh, beans, uh, so green beans. Um, you can also find them in uh, lima beans, peas, black-eyed peas. Uh, so all types of the foods like that are going to have polysaccharides in them uh, that are starches. And such so starches are um, easily broken down into monosaccharides and disaccharides, but they actually come in a more complex form of polysaccharides. And they take a little bit longer to break down by those digestive enzymes we talked about. By lama amylase, it's going to take longer for them to actually be broken down. And it's going to be taking a little bit longer there at that, that brush border of the mucosa and actually be broken down by the enzymes to be taken across into the cell membrane. Uh, cellulose is also a polysaccharide. Uh, and they're going to be found in a lot of your leafy vegetables and then things like grass trees. Uh, this is where you're going to find cellulose. And these are very complex polysaccharides. And usually cellulose is going to require bacterial digestion uh, or fermentative digestion to actually break down these polysaccharides. They're not going to uh, occur very easily through the stomach and the small intestine. Glucose is the main monosaccharide that's used as energy throughout the body. So it's going to be used in the Krebs cycle. Uh, it's the simplest, smallest dietary carbohydrate. Uh, and uh, it's broken down and uh, converted into ATP through a process in the cytoplasm called glycolysis. And then the, the waste products of uh, glycolysis called pyruvates then run through the Krebs cycle uh, and extra ATP is made. If the body has too much glucose, uh, this excess of glucose is actually going to be converted and stored into glycogen in the liver or it can be converted and stored as fat in adipose tissue. Also remember that excess glucose will also be stored as glycogen in the muscles for the muscle to use when it's actually going to need extra energy. Lipids are fats. 
Uh, remember that they're neutral in charge. Carbohydrates are going to have a charge to them, so they'll dissolve in water. Lipids are insoluble in water because they're neutral in charge. Uh, however, lipids are soluble in other lipids and other organic uh, solvents. So one way that we break down lipids a lot of times is by uh, alcohol because alcohol is actually an organic solvent. So ethyl alcohol or isopropyl alcohol. There's four main categories we look at here, which is going to be the neutral fats, which are like triglyceride, phospholipids, which are going to be found in, in the cell membranes uh, and membranes of organelles, steroids. These are going to make up uh, cholesterol and different hormones and then we have other lipoid su substances. Uh, neutral uh, fats if you remember are going to be called triglycerides because there's three fatty acid chains hooked onto a glycerol sugar skeleton. We kind of name them based on the number of carbon atoms in their backbone so we have long chain, medium chain, and short chain um, fatty acids. Uh, usually the longer the chain, uh, the more energy that's going to actually be stored in that neutral fat. So here's your typical uh, triglyceride. You have the glycerol backbone, which is sugar, and then you have your fatty acid chains. Remember that saturated fats are going to have just single bonds between the carbons, and uh, non-saturated or unsaturated fats, there's going to be at least one double bond between the carbon here. Also remember that your fats are going to have two and a quarter times more energy uh, per weight, volume of weight uh, than uh, a carbohydrate is. So uh, a gram of fat will have 2.25 times as much energy in it as a gram of uh, sugar or other carbohydrate. Here's an example of an unsaturated fat. And so they kind of call these monosaturated uh, or monounsaturated, diunsaturated. And then like this one right here is what they call a polyunsaturated because there's four of these double bonds. Uh, a lot of times uh, these are actually broken down by the animal, uh, these uh, unsaturated fats into saturated fats. Uh, so when these actually enter the body and they go through the liver, they'll actually be converted from unsaturated to saturated fat. There's uh, been a thing for years that uh, unsaturated fat's more healthy than saturated fat, but we know for a fact when it goes to the liver, all unsaturated fats become saturated fats. So they don't really make any difference um, because these things are going to be broken down and, and absorbed in uh, through the body and, and changed into the liver from unsaturated to saturated. Main things to know is saturated fats like this right here, is animal-based sources. Animals can only make saturated fats. Uh, and unsaturated fats are only going to be made by plants. The liver can convert one fatty acid to the other uh, for the most part. However, there are three essential fatty acids uh, that the liver cannot synthesize. So it cannot actually make these fatty acids uh, of these neutral fats. Uh, linolic, uh, lin linolenic acid, uh, linolin, uh, linoic acid and arachidonic acids. Uh, all these are ingested from plant sources or like by a cat um, from another animal and they enter into the body and, and the liver cannot actually make these or change these fats around. They actually have to be uh, ingested. So uh, linolenic uh, or linolic, sorry, linolenic and then arachidonic. And said there's 2.25 times as much uh, energy from a fat uh, by weight as there would be in a protein or a carbohydrate. Protein is in carbohydrates by, by weight. So a gram of protein and a gram of carbohydrate will give off about the same amount of energy. Um, but if you take, compare them to a gram of fat, um, there's 2.25 or 2.25 times as much energy in a fat as there is in a carbohydrate or protein. One thing about neutral fats is they're needed to absorb um, fat-soluble vitamins A, D, E, and K. So when we get into vitamins and we're talking about fat-soluble, these fat-soluble vitamins come from plant sources or they might be ingested uh, once again by uh, carnivores by eating another animal. Uh, but the body's not actually able to synthesize these uh, vitamins. Uh, and they originate with a plant source, and so they have to be ingested uh, by the animal. And they're actually brought and transported across by fats, and they're actually stored in uh, the neutral fats.
a lot of the fats are actually contained in the subcutaneous area and, and, and things um, such as the omentum covering the abdomen. They also help to cushion a lot of your vital organs such as the heart, kidneys, eyes. So they have several different roles besides just being an energy source. Uh, they can also be a, a storage for the vitamins and an important insulator and actually work as a cushion. Phospholipids are modified triglycerides so we drop off one of those fatty acid chains and we end up putting on a phosphorus group instead so it makes a polarized head and if you remember when we looked at these the polar heads actually attach uh, and the neutral fats stick out and these make up cell membranes and membranes of, of organelles and so what they do is they kind of um, repel water uh, to the outside but they kind of attract it to the inside uh, and this is what all of your me uh, membranes of cells and their organelles are going to be made up of uh, and a lot of times these have to actually be ingested in the body they'll be broken down and reassembled and they're going to come from plant or anim animal cell membranes either one work perfectly fine for phospholipids for the body steroids are uh, four flat interlocking rings of hydrochloric carbons the main one's going to be cholesterol and cholesterol uh, is where you're going to get a lot of your sex hormones made from uh, they also are important in making bile salts Pretty much all of your steroid molecules are going to be made from those cholesterol rings and so these are going to be the main ones that we end up looking at of these hormones are going to be corticosteroids so things like uh, cortisol or the synthetic version of it's known as cortisone uh, you're going to have testosterone progesterone uh, and estrogen all these are actually going to be made from cholesterol and cholesterol is found in uh, also in rafts and the plasma membranes of a lot of cells and your liver is actually able to manufacture cholesterol uh, from the different steroids that the body ingests so these are actually broken down into simple steroids uh, or into simple carbon rings and then they're reassembled into cholesterol by the liver other lipoid uh, substances um, these are going to be, of course, fat-soluble vitamins we talked about. We do have a special group of things called lipoproteins, which are half lipids and half proteins. Uh, the body uses a lot of these for chemical messengers. They also use them in the cell membranes as uh, rafts for a lot of uh, signalers between uh, chemical reactions between cells. Uh, and then we actually have things derived from arachidonic acid. So uh, we've talked about prostaglandins, so uh, these inflammatory mediators actually have a lipid uh, portion to them. Leukotrienes, which are very important uh, for inflammation and inciting inflammation in the body, these also have a lipid um, component to it. And thromboxanes, these are very important for blood clotting and these all have a lipid uh, portion to them. Proteins, <clears throat> a lot of these are structural uh, in nature in the body but they can also be used as chemical messengers. They can also be used as enzymes. Primary structural material, so a lot of uh, things like your tendons and ligaments uh, are going to be made up of proteins. Uh, so when we start looking at things like collagen, um, elastase, all these things are going to be made up. A lot of your scaffolding for the connective tissue and the body, your ground matrix and all this that's structural in nature is going to end up being made up of protein. Uh, enzymes and hormones, a lot of these are actually protein in nature too. And so they regulate body function. Uh, they're also important in movement of uh, nutrients uh, through the body. In this case, oxygen right here with hemoglobin. Remember, the, the oxygen does actually bind to the iron in hemoglobin. However, uh, the iron has to be bound to something, and that ends up being a heme molecule and a globin molecule. And then they also aid in movement. So a lot of the proteins, uh, a lot of your inside your skeletal, cardiac, and smooth muscle, those actin and myosin heads are actually made up of proteins. So they actually also have a, a motor function to them too. Talk about it. Remember, we were talking about how large that these amino acids can be uh, when you compare them to like a lot of your carbohydrates. Uh, and this is, uh, or... Um, electrolytes, a lot of your other nutrients. Um, because you have a nitrogen with two hydrogens right here, you have several carbons um, with hydrogens and oxygens and a hydroxyl group. And then you have an R group. 
uh, right here, which like in valine, you have three carbons uh, with several uh, hydrogens. So when you look at this, um, there's actually a lot more molecules in this simple amino acid right here uh, than what you're going to actually find in like glucose. And one of the main things that you're always going to find is this amino group right here. Uh, when it's actually broken down, this amine group actually moves into ammonia. Uh, and the body a lot of times actually converts this over to, to keep ammonia is very caustic to the body. So the body uh, from protein catabolism, when it's actually broken down, proteins broken down, ammonia will be released and the body will actually bind two ammonias together. And that's how you get urea. Uh, and urea is not that irritating to the body and can easily be removed. We named the proteins based off of the different R groups that they have right here. And there's 22 different amino acids. And remember, the, the, these are going to be put into chains. So they're going to be put into a dipeptide, a tripeptide, and then into a polypeptide. And polypeptides can be anywhere from 99 amino acids or less. There are a few proteins that might be as few as 50 amino acids put together. But most of the time, they're going to be a, a 100 or more to be a protein. And there's some of these proteins that can easily have up to 10,000 amino acids in them. So between amino acids, we have what we call a peptide bond, hence the name polypeptide. And so when we get 10 or more of these bound together, um, we get a polypeptide chain. Proteins at minimum are 50 uh, or more amino acids, but generally it's actually can be like more like 100. So there is some range between what's a protein and what's a polypeptide, depending on the protein we're looking at. Um, so some very small proteins are just 50, but a lot of proteins actually do start off closer to 100. As I said, there's between 100 to 10,000 amino acids can actually go into a pro protein structure, and there's some proteins that can actually be actually past this 10,000 um, mark right here of amino acids. And the order uh, and the type of amino acids that are put together to, uh, determines the structure and the function of the protein. So it's how we put these amino acids together, which amino acids go together to determine uh, what this protein is going to do and what's its structure and what's its function in the body going to be. When we look at it here, uh, essential amino acids are ones that have to be in the animal's diet. And so they have this little chart right here um, that actually shows um, the essential amino acids. So um, when we look at it, um, for all animals, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten of the 22 amino acids are going to be uh, essential for all animals. Uh, and if you look on page 293, they actually show you um, some of the essential amino acids. And then they also show you over here on the side, there's some of the non-essential amino acids. The essential ones are going to be tryptophan, methionine, valine, theonine. Uh, phenylalanine, leucine, isoleucine, lysine, histidine, and arginine. So all of these have to be ingested by uh, the animal. The animal's not, and the liver is not actually able to make or change these uh, amino acids into something else. So all of these right here have to be ingested uh, by the animal. Um, the other 12 amino acids, the body's actually able to break down, reconfigure in the liver, and and make those amino acids as it needs to. But these 10 for all species of avian and mammals have to be ingested. Uh, in addition, we have one called taurine. Our body's able to make taurine. A dog's body's able to make taurine. But this is in pink uh, because cats specifically cannot make their own taurine. Uh, their liver is incapable of doing it. Uh, and this is actually... Uh, uh, an ingredient that's very important in cat food. If they're lacking taurine, um, cats will become very ill. So all cat diets, we have to make sure are balanced and have taurine in them. Usually if it's not a problem, if it's from an animal protein source, because taurine is very um, prevalent in uh, uh, animal cells. Um, however, if you were to have something like some of your dry foods that are um, plant-based for cat food, um, you would want to make sure that they had that added. In addition, for avian, uh, and specifically for poultry, they have to have glycine added to their diets. And they're, they're unable to make glycine, so we have to make sure that they actually have glycine added for um, chickens, ducks, geese, 
Uh, and a lot of your other birds too, a lot of your other birds will have to have glycine and we have to make sure that that's in the diet. Usually if they're eating a proper diet, such as a cytosine, like a, uh, um, a parrot, then they're going to actually get it from a lot of the fruits and vegetables they eat. It's not a problem. Uh, but we have a lot more problems when we go into grain-based diets with them, making sure they have enough glycine. Nitrogen balance. So this is something uh, a lot of times animals can have excessive amino acids. And so uh, amino acids not used to make protein are actually then converted by the cell to make energy or um, specifically that can be converted over into carbohydrates and fats. Uh, a positive nitrogen balance, the body is incorporating more protein into the tissue than it is uh, using ATP to make it, uh, meaning that the, the body has an adequate protein source and therefore it's not having to expend energy to make uh, proteins. Uh, a negative protein balance occurs when uh, the body's actually having to break down protein um, to actually make ATP uh, and or it's having to uh, borrow and use a lot of uh, uh, nitrogen uh, from its own protein sources to make other proteins that it's needing um, and so proteins not actually being incorporated in the tissue it's actually being broken down so one of the main things is we're always want to make sure animals are in a positive balance that they have the proper amount of uh, nitrogen and protein to where they can easily incorporate and make proteins. Uh, they can potentially use it as a, an energy source. They're making uh, muscles, whereas if we have a negative nitrogen balance, then they're actually having to tear down their muscles, trying to get enough nitrogen or trying to fuel the body with enough energy. Vitamins. Uh, when we look at a lot of our vitamins, a lot of our vitamins are actually going to be used uh, as parts of coenzymes. Uh, or as enzymes themselves. Uh, and so a lot of times these things have regulatory uh, capabilities that they can speed up certain metabolic processes or they're important for certain metabolic processes to go on. An example of this would be vitamin D. Vitamin D is very important uh, in moving calcium in and out of the bones for the body to be uh, as the body needs to use it. Or vitamin E. Vitamin E is very important to stabilize the smell cell membrane is called an antioxidant. It actually keeps um, oxygen-free radicals from actually breaking down phospholipid. Most vitamins uh, of your vitamins are actually consumed through plant substances or outside of the body. Uh, however, your body does have the capability to make some B vitamins. Um, it's important to know that your fat-soluble vitamins uh, are going to be A, D, E, and K. And these actually have to be... Uh, uh, ingested in the body. Um, vitamin K is not actually made by the intestinal bacteria, but it's actually converted by the ba intestinal bacteria into a, a form that can be ingested in the body. Um, so your fat soluble vitamins have to come from a plant source. Uh, some of your B vitamins can actually, these water soluble vitamins, um, are easily absorbed through the GI tract in water. Um, and uh, one thing to know is a lot of times some of these can actually be made um, by the, your GI tract, specifically the bacteria in your GI tract. So a lot of times things like B1, B2, B3, B5, B9, B12, which is thiamine, riboflavin, niacin, uh, panothenic acid, folic acid, and cyanocobamin uh, B12. Um, these things can actually be made by your body and actually absorbed uh, across uh, the cell membranes uh, from the bacteria. Um, they can also be ingested from food sources. Uh, a lot of animals can make their own vitamin C. Um, we actually lack that capability. Uh, the vitamin C that our bacteria end up making in our gut, for whatever reason, uh, will not absorb against uh, across our colon. Uh, and the same thing happens with guinea pigs. So we actually have to ingest this through um, plant sources. And so green leafy vegetables, citrus, um, usually have a fairly good source of vitamin C. A very poor source of vitamin C is anything that would be green um, or anything that's not fresh. So uh, like dried fruit, um, hay, things like that are actually fairly low in vitamin C. Fat soluble vitamins when they're ingested, uh, they're going to be bound to lipids when they're absorbed across um, and they're stored for a long period of time in the tissues. One thing about water soluble vitamins is 
Um, they're, they kind of circulate through. They're used in the cell. They're constantly coming in, um, but the excesses are excreted in the urine, uh, and it's very rare to have a toxicity. Um, it's kind of rare to have a toxicity in your fat-soluble vitamins, but it can happen. Um, you can build up excessive levels and actually have um, some uh, toxicity from probably the one most common we see a toxicity too is an excessive volume of vitamin D. Vitamin A um, is needed or known as beta carotene is needed a lot uh, for a lot of uh, functions within the body. Um, vitamin D, uh, a lot of vitamin A is stored in the fat near your skin uh, and vitamin D, the only thing you need to get it is to expose the vitamin A and the sub-Q tissue to sunlight and voila, you get vitamin D. Uh, one thing that they've done over the years uh, to make sure that people get adequate vitamin D levels uh, is we've added it to the milk. And the reason uh, it's very easy for them to do in milk, and the reason why that is, is um, they expose uh, milk that has a lot of vitamin A to ultraviolet light, and you convert a lot of that vitamin A over to vitamin D. Vitamin E is very important um, for actually keeping uh, inflammation down in the body. And then vitamin K plays a huge role in coagulation. It would be rare to have a vitamin K toxicity, but if you did ingest too much, that is a possibility, and you could actually have hypercoagulation from that. Minerals, these are going to be inorganic substances, not energy producing, so these are your different salts. Uh, we kind of break them down into different groups. Um, we're going to have macro minerals, uh, which are minerals that the body is going to use and need to take in on a daily basis and uh, in a larger quantity. And these are going to be things like sodium, potassium, chloride, uh, calcium, magnesium, phosphorus. Um, and these have to be taken in in a, in a larger amount compared to other minerals daily because the body's very dependent on these uh, minerals to actually um, have action potentials and uh, actually be used to do things like calcium is important for blood clotting, but it's also important for muscle movement. Um, sodium and potassium have to be used in order to actually cause action potential. Micro minerals, uh, these have to be ingested daily. The body uses them, but they're, they're, they're needed in less amounts. So these are things like copper, iodine, iron, manganese, selenium, and zinc. Selenium is an antioxidant. Iron is needed to, to help maintain uh, hemoglobin levels um, to where oxygen, oxygen can be transported. Uh, iodine and copper are used by the nervous system and in certain enzymes, so zinc. Trace elements are ones that are needed in very small amounts. And so some examples of these are things like chromium, cobalt, fluorine, uh, molybdenum, nickel, silicon, sulfur, and vanadium. Um, so these are needed in much smaller amounts compared to your mac macro and micro minerals. So the next one we'll do will be cell metabolism.